Hi, I'm Jamie Davis, the Podmedic. We're here at EMS Expo in Dallas, 2010, and Physio Control has brought us in again to go ahead and talk to some of the people they have here. And of course, most exciting is that I am able to sit down with Cam Pollock again. Cam, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Things are well. Cam, you are the Director of Marketing? I'm the Vice President Vice of Marketing. President of Marketing. Yeah. I, I, should, I should probably know your title so that I can say it correctly, but um, yeah. there's some exciting things. I think we spoke last uh, directly face-to-face -face at EMS Today, Yes. talking about uh, some of the things that are going on, but we're back here at EMS Expo, yep. and uh, you know, these events are really special. What, what, do you, what do you take away and your people take away from events like this? Well, you know, this is, this is one of the two biggest uh, EMS oriented trade shows that, that happen during the year. We're always excited to come. Uh, it's a real good chance for us to get in front of our customers. And you know, it's really important for us to get that kind of feedback from our customers. Uh, we have a lot of our uh, people using our equipment come to our booth. I would say the majority of people who come by and stop by are actually physio users. We do a certain amount of new user demos, but a lot of it's just keeping in touch with, with who our current users are. And uh, so we can show them what's new, we can show them what's, you know, sometimes we can show them what's coming. Uh, and, and one of the big emphasis that we have uh, right now is in continuing education. So we've, with both this trade show, EMS Expo, as well as EMS Today, we've, we've been consistently doing the Learning Center. And this time we've got 12 unique programs that we're bringing for continuing education credits. So a great chance for our customers to get some hands-on type learning. And I, I had an opportunity to interview some of the uh, speakers, and you've got a, a, a really a, a wonderful lineup and a, a good variety of stuff. I mean, it's not just, it's not all ACS and 12 lead. I right. mean, it really is a full gamut of patient care, which is great. Yeah, we've done a lot with 12 lead, and, and that's still one of the biggest hits. Um, you know, Tim Phelan's here, of course, and he's course. Always, always in demand. He's kind of the rock star of, mm -hmm. the, uh, of the show. But... Uh, we, we like to have uh, we like to have some variety. People are, are you know, if they've already come and done a 12 lead uh, course with us, we want to give them some other opportunities. So we're not only doing 12 lead. We've got several flavors of 12 lead training. We've got Tim talking about 15 and 18 lead a little bit as well. Um, we've got some quality assurance mm -hmm. um, information. Um, we've got some uh, a course on capnography, mm -hmm. which is uh, I think you know an up and coming parameter that a lot of people are using more and more. Um, we've got something on grants and how you get grants. So there's a whole variety of topics that people can get some education on this year. And it's, it's fantastic to, to make that available so that you know, the people that can't afford to pay for the full session just coming to the exhibit hall to an event like this are still going to get some education from Physio Control to, right. to help them be better at patient care and better serve their communities. Right. And, that's, and for us, that's, that's the, whole, the whole thing. I mean, we, we try and be uh, as much a part of... Uh, the operations of our customers as we can, and we know that you know that they have we have equipment that we purchase that they purchase from us and that we provide, but that's only part of what we can provide to them. It's really a complete solution. It's the the technical service, it's the education, it's follow up, um, it's consulting from our sales and service people. So we're really trying to um, help our customers clinically and operationally as much as we can. And I think you're doing a great job of it. I mean, I, we've said this before. I mean, I, we use physio in our, in our system. I've been a physio fan for a long time. And I'm one of those customers that loves to come by your booth and see what you guys are doing. And speaking of what you're doing, there's something really fun going on at this event, uh, the Lucas CPR Challenge. Yes. Now, that's the pitting the man versus machine. Right. Let's explain a little bit about what, what you're doing there. Well, uh, as you know, we have a product that, uh, from our partners in Sweden called Deal Life. It's a Lucas Mechanical Chest Compression product. And uh, the, the whole point of Lucas is to do perfect CPR. It's, uh, there's a lot of research that's been going on the last few years. You know, the, a lot of the emphasis in the uh, 2005 guideline changes were around CPR improvements. And it's not just... You know, it's not just one facet of CPR. Right. It's making sure you're getting the correct number of chest compressions at 100. It's making sure you're getting the right depth at one and a half to two inches. Um, and perhaps most important, it's continuous CPR. Mm -hmm. It's getting on the chest and staying on the chest and not having the constant inter interruptions. And it, 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 makes, uh, it sets up defibrillation to be more successful if you're priming the heart, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, you're basically perfusing the brain and the, the vital organs in the body. And all the research is pretty much... Um, very conclusive that good CPR really does change the way resuscitation and survival rates look. And uh, you, know, you can't get better than Lucas. Right. It, Lucas delivers 100 compressions per minute at the appropriate depth and continuously. You can transport a patient up and down stairs. It doesn't get tired, all those kind of things. 
So we really wanted to emphasize that mm -hmm. this year. Uh, some of the people we talked to say, well, we've got firefighters, we've got people, we do pretty good CPR. <laughs> we, got, we got strong backs and weak minds. We don't need any of that. And I don't mean this call firefighters strong backs and weak <laughs> minds. But I know exactly what you're saying. I've heard that argument about a lot of things. Right, right. And, it, and, it's, and part of it's true. I mean, there, there are systems out there that do great CPR today. And if you've got people who can do CPR really well and you can keep it fresh, um, you know, the, there's, there's a lot of great examples of peeping, people doing good CPR. But um, all the research also shows that even the best performers of CPR can't keep it up for a long period of time, you know, a minute, two minutes at best. Mm -hmm. um, so you're cycling people when you're cycling, that's causing pauses. It's also inconsistent because you know, you're not going to line up three right. people who do it the same way. Um, it also takes a lot of bodies. You, know, you got people standing there, it's, it adds to the chaos of the scene. So uh, part of this here is really trying to illustrate that to people and saying, look, you know, let's, let's put it to the test. If you guys think you're great at doing CPR, let's challenge it. And we did this at the emergency nurses conference last week, and we found that uh, on a score of 1 to 100, the average was less than 80. Some people were even much less than that. There was only a few, a handful. Less than 10% of people could, could even keep up with Lucas for, for two minutes. So I, we're and then what beyond two minutes, right? Because two right. minutes, anyone who's done CPR for two minutes, you're, you're winded already. And to go beyond that is just... It's a lot of work. So part of the point is to prove that it's difficult to keep up with Lucas. And the other is just to remind people just how tiring it is. And this is in a trade show setting. It's not nearly as chaotic or, or stressful as a, an actual event, of course. Um, but, you know, the Lucas has a lot of benefits other than the clinical side as well. People who have used Lucas, we're finding, um, don't want to go back and for a number of reasons. Uh, part of it is they actually see the results. They see patients who previously might have had, you know, the purple toes mm -hmm. and now they're pink. They have patients waking up in the middle of a cardiac arrest trying to pull their tubes out um, because they're so well perfused. Mm -hmm. They've got a pulse, they've got end tidal CO2 values that are almost normal. Uh, so clinically they're seeing the difference mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it's yet to be proven that it makes a, a long-term difference in a wide population in survival rates. And there's studies going on about that, but that's yet to be proven. But anecdotally, what people see with their own eyes, they see it makes a clinical difference. But beyond that, uh, I've had several people tell me that even if it was the same, they still wouldn't give up their Lucas because it has a lot of other benefits, one of which is, is changing the way codes are managed. Mm -hmm. it, you know, you've been at codes before, yep. anyone who's I been know. in a code, you know how chaotic it is. A lot of people, a lot of things going on. All of a sudden, when you put Lucas on and all that CPR task, which is one of the most important tasks to establish early, is taken care of. Mm -hmm. And it's happening automatically. You've got a couple of set of hands free. You've kind of slowed time down, and you can take your time to do things right. And so it, it really has changed for the people using Lucas, changed how they manage code situations. And it's also safer. You know, it's safer for, you know, there's plenty of injuries that happen, back injuries, things like that, people performing CPR. And, uh, and of course, if, if you're transporting a patient, it's not safe to be, to be standing up and doing CPR in the back of a moving rig. Right. So you, ke you keep your medics belted in. You know, you can do CPR while you're moving the patient downstairs where you couldn't do it otherwise. So there's a lot of benefits beyond just the pure clinical side. But we're trying to kind of call those out. So we've got this challenge. It's called uh, uh, the Lucas CPR Challenge, Man Against Machine. And uh, we're inviting people to come to the booth take on Lucas, and uh, every day there's a winner, and the winner's got uh, some continuing education mm -hmm. benefits. They're getting a year subscription to uh, get some- Center Learn. Yeah, yep. to, get some, to get some online learning. Excellent. Yeah. Now, I, I, had, I, I got to ask this question, because you said something before we started recording, but uh, you, you did take the Lucas Challenge yourself. How'd you do? I did. I actually did, I actually did better than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, was, I was very close to the, uh, to the right rate, uh, but I'm pretty familiar with, with the rate. I, I think I ended up at 101. Uh, my, my compressions were off. Uh, they were actually, most of them were too deep. Too deep? Too deep. I a little thought, too enthusiastic? Yeah, I think I was uh, bottoming out on the spine. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I got the rate pretty well. But uh, it was a hard workout, though. I'm, I'm I only gonna, did it for 60 seconds. Yeah, I'm going to head up and give it a shot yeah. later. I'm going to stop by and uh, do the Lucas Challenge at some point during Expo. Cause You're welcome. I, I, I'm, I'm a CPR instructor. It's something I'm passionate about. I, I teach it. Can I do it? Right. And I, I, I know I work in the field, and, and, but as a paramedic, how often does a paramedic actually do CPR anymore? Because you have the other bodies. Right. Um, and, and so it's, yeah, I got to see if I, let's see how I match up. Well, well to... it'll be stressful for you because, you know, <laughs> you, there's a lot of pressure that you're going to get 100 percent, I think. So one other thing that I wanted to talk to you about, because I heard some, some inklings about a um, new refurbished product program that right. you guys are instituting. Yep. Um, tell me a little bit about this program from Physio. Uh, it's, not, it's not something that intuitively 
as a person who's purchased products, you know, as a chief officer before, uh, and refurbished product. Right. So I, mean, make, I have questions, but I know sure. you guys are safe. So what, what's going on? How's this program going to work? So uh, it, we've, had, we've had a program like this, similar to this in the past. Um, and it's, it's been a few years since we've had something like this going. This really takes it to another level. Mm -hmm. uh, the program's called RELI, R-E-L-I, and it stands for Refurbished Equipment from Life-Saving Innovators. You had to have a good acronym. Gotta love it. Um, and it, it really is patterned after uh, like a Lexus program, certified pre-owned. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're, as people are upgrading to products like the LifePak 15, uh, they oftentimes have used product like LifePak 12s that they've been using for a number of years. And uh, sometimes those got sold off uh, from third-party distributors and such. And uh, you know, sometimes that is going to work, and sometimes it's not. Uh, you know, one of the things that if I was in that situation, I would be asking is, what exactly has this equipment been through? What level is it up to? So we have pretty high standards. Uh, when we're doing a, a, a swap, or we're, we have someone buying, a customer buying LifePak 15s, and we're taking 12s on trade, uh, we take them back in, and they have to have, meet a certain standard, first of all. They have to be at a certain level. They have to have a certain number of hours. We can track how long they've have actually been, in been service, used, right? been in service. Um, so there's a, a, there's a whole set that just don't qualify off the bottom. You know, we take them right off the bottom. Some of them are scrapped, and some are used for some parts. But uh, the ones that pass our standard, we put through kind of a full recertification. It goes, uh, the software's upgraded to the latest software standards. Um, Anything that's uh, worn is replaced. It goes through full testing in the factory, just like a brand new unit would. So it's essentially taking a, a LifePak 12 and you know, making sure it passes a certain standard and putting it back out to the marketplace for customers who either don't have the funding uh, for LifePak 15 um, or uh, haven't changed their standardization process yet. Now I have some examples of customers who um, are planning on purchasing LifePak 15s um, in the budget with their cycle two or three years from now, but they need to uh, replace just a few LifePak 12. So that would be perfect for them. It gets uh, kind of keeps their fleet intact until they can do a full swap over. Right. And it's, uh, we, it, it's a program that we're uh, going to institute across all our product line. The 12 is the first one okay. because of the 15 coming in. We've had a lot of interest, um, not only in people trying to keep that fleet intact, but in also some smaller volunteer uh, type services who might not have the funding uh, to purchase a, a LifePak 15, which is really kind of the, the Cadillac. Uh, so we want to be able to keep those f people in the physio family as well. So it's a, we're excited about it. Uh, we think that there's a lot of interest. We have several hundred units uh, available now with LifePak 12s, and uh, I think they're going to go pretty fast. Now, if they wanted something like this, they would just contact their physio local physio salesperson distributor? Yep. Um, yep, the same, per the same person who's selling them a LifePak 15 or LifePak 1000. Or Lucas or whatever, they would yep. just contact them. Yep. Uh, when you, I, it's interesting you brought this, when I saw this coming across that we were maybe talking about this today, I was really intrigued by it because one of the things I've noticed lately, we're waiting for the new cardiac arrest, CPR, and, and ACLS guidelines to come out here very shortly right. Right. from the American Heart Association. And I think two weeks ago, I saw a press release from a pretty large service announcing that they were instituting 12 leads. Hmm. It's 2010. And so clearly, and of course, then there's all those smaller services and smaller companies out there that, you know, have been using a LifePak 10 right. forever. You know, they can't even get batteries, you know. <laughs> and, and so they want to upgrade. They want to meet standards. They want to be in, at the standard of care, but they can't do it at a 15 level. And so I was really intrigued by this because I think you're, you're right on the mark. I think there's, there's a strong, there's a market out there for people that want equipment that's good, high quality equipment, but right. can't afford the latest, greatest. Well, there's a hundred, we put out a hundred thousand uh, LifePak 12s, install base of LifePak 12s around the world is a hundred thousand devices. That's a big install base. And there's no way we could expect, you know, everybody's going to shift over to LifePak 15s immediately. Um, you know, we know people tend to use their equipment for six, seven, eight, even longer uh, years. So um, we, we really wanted to be sensitive to that and, and help people make a transition. You know, even the way we designed the LifePak 15, as you know, was designed to make it an easy transition. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, this, I think, will help. Uh, we're kind of at the end of life on the LifePak 12s. Uh, we've got a few new ones left, but we're, you know, by this, by this uh, end of this calendar year, we won't have new 12s available anymore. Um, but uh, I think this will be a good bridge for, for some of our customers. You mentioned the, the guidelines. and, and uh, uh, you know, we've, we've gotten some questions from customers about the guidelines right. as well. Um, you know, 
2005 guidelines came out, you know, five years ago, and it was just to be blunt, a, a painful process. Oh like, my goodness! You know, across yeah. the entire industry. <laughs> I was chief at that point, and it was like people. My providers were coming, going, do I do the guidelines or not? I haven't had a new CPR class. We didn't have the training materials. I mean, it was, right. I think the, you know, the guidelines came out and it was a year and a half until we got some of the new training materials we needed. Right, I mean, it was, it was across the board. It was, you know, American Heart took a while to get their training materials available. Uh, customers took a while to, to kind of adjust to what the new guidelines were. The manufacturers all um, had to make adjustments to their equipment. Mm -hmm. And when this medical equipment is controlled, in the tight regulatory process right. that we have with the FDA, you can't make changes very quickly. Uh, so, you know, my, our response to to our customers who are asking this, these questions, and we've posted a letter from our president on our website, Great. And, and we're starting to track this, is that this time around, we're gonna try and make it go a lot smoother. Um, our goal, and we, we, we got a, a cross-functional group in our company together uh, a few months back. We've actually been planning for this for a couple of years, trying to be as ready as we can. Mm -hmm. Um, and our whole goal is to say, how can we make this a great experience for our customers? That's, that's the bar that we're setting for ourselves. Um, some of it, there's only so much we can do ahead of time because, as, as I'm sure you know, the information is embargoed. I know that I've talked to some of the people who wrote the guidelines. They're a mum about it. It's all embargoed. Uh, they're written, but they can't talk about it. It's being announced on October 18th. I, I'm, I've, I have a press conference set up with somebody from the American Heart Association on the morning of the 18th That's already perfect. because I want to know right right and I don't you know and, and, and the, the jury's out on how much change is going to be yeah. uh, I've heard uh, rumors that it may not be as big a change as we heard in 2005 as we saw in 2005 I've heard other rumors that say they might be at equal or greater changes so nobody knows nobody in the industry knows what exactly is coming there's you know rumors out there uh, but uh, we want to just be as prepared as we can. So we've already looked across our product line. If changes um, are to occur that would impact our products, we have projects kind of queued up to do that. We're not going to start them until we know what the exact changes are. <laughs> yeah. um, so our customers are going to have to be a little bit patient, um, and not just our customers, but you know anyone out there, no matter what manufacturer mm -hmm. they're using, they're going to need to be a little bit patient knowing that those manufacturers are going to find out at the same time they do in October they'll have to go through a planning process. And if it involves significant changes, it could be you know, six, nine, 12 months to cycle those through. And if it, you know, if it has to go through the FDA, that's, that's an approval process. But uh, what we're committed to doing is making it as simple as possible, as easy as possible for our customers, and communicating. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna be posting what's going on, what our plans are on our website. Um, we're gonna uh, make it very, we're gonna arm all our sales and service people with the information. And so, at the very least, we're going to make sure our customers know what we're doing and when we're doing it, and that's what we're committed to. I think, I think we'll all appreciate that very much. I, I, we, I think we just assume that you guys are on the in. Yeah. You know, we, you, you know what it is. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, when a new iPhone comes out, you know, the case manufacturers have the cases there on day one. Obviously, they knew what it was going to look like. Right. Uh, but you don't have any, you know, none of the manufacturers have any kind of inside track other than no. looking at the research like the rest of us are doing and speculating. Right. We've seen the, you know, the, the, there have been some public mm -hmm. um, working groups and public um, working papers that are, that are out there. Uh, but it is, it is speculation. I, I, yeah, I'd be very surprised if we don't see you know, continued uh, emphasis on CPR. Mm -hmm. That's certainly going to be there. Uh, yeah, but beyond that, um, you know, and I, I'm sure hypothermia will be, will be given mm -hmm. you know, even more emphasis than it has been in the past and probably 12 lead too. Some of the things that we've seen over the research uh, over the last few years have been emphasized. So those are not, won't be surprises to anyone. Um, you know, I've, I've heard that perhaps even capnography might take a, a more prominent spot. Um, but, uh, but nobody knows, but right? But nobody knows. <laughs> nobody knows. Um, the guidelines are, and, and AHA is very consistent about this, that they, um, you know, they, they are very clear they don't want to give an unfair advantage to anyone. And uh, if they were going to bring in industry, they'd have to make sure they got everybody in industry. And so they're, they keep it quiet. And uh, there's only a few select people on the inside who know, but the industry's not part of it. And so it does present some challenges for us. But uh, we understand the reasoning behind it, and we're all in the same boat. So we're going to just make sure that we make it a good experience for our customers. Well, that's important to know. I'm glad. I'm glad we, I found that out because you know, I, honestly, I assumed you all you know, had you know it all in the bag. You're just waiting to roll it out. But you're going to have to write new software. I mean, it's not just changing a switch. If if the AED rules change, 
right. you've got to write all new software. It, it, right. It's not just a, something that they can just change a dial somewhere. Right, and that's possible. Um, you know, there were some major changes in 2005, and it, it really did uh, impact a lot, almost everyone in, in the industry side. I'm, I'm really not expecting changes like that this time, and we've we've been um, we've learned from that experience, and we've we've uh, we've designed software that's more flexible. So there's a, there's a lot of changes that could happen where customers could actually go in and change setups in their own software. Oh, okay. So uh, I, you know, I don't think it's going to have the same kind of impact. I don't think people should be too worried about it. Um, and, and we've also really, uh, in communication with American Heart, uh, have asked them, and as well as others in industry, have asked the same question to try and manage expectations. That when the, if the guidelines change, it doesn't mean you have to change your protocols tomorrow. Right. There's there is a period where people need to get retrained, and manufacturers there, there's a there's a grace period. It's not as if the 2005 li guidelines aren't going to work. They've been we've been relying on it for the last five years, and mm -hmm. uh, I think it, if anything, it'll be some tweaks. Yeah. Well, great. We'll see. As always, Cam, it's a pleasure to sit down and talk with you, uh, not, ju not just as a physio customer, but to kind of get an in insight into things like this about how the industry works. Because I think the more, the more everyone's customers understand how the process works, the better prepared they are to deal with changes in the system. Right, right. So thank you very much. You're welcome.